All right, folks. Good. Uh, a good morning to Chad and Julio. Um, I know you folks are on the West Coast. Um, I also you met with uh, with Bill and on Sunday he told me it was quite fun. So good to see you two on the uh, on the chat here. Uh, anyone else that we have while we're waiting? Looks like we have a couple concurrent viewers. All right, well, we've got two, Chad and Julia. So you folks know the, the drill at this point. Feel free to ask questions at, uh, at any time. Let's go through, uh, let's go through this particular chapter. Oh, we have Lars as well, fantastic. All right, so uh, I'm gonna dive in. It's gonna be a pretty short, an easy one this week. Uh, this, this chapter was honestly quite conceptually straightforward, which was which was a nice after a couple of chapters that had a lot of different math in it. But let's uh, let's get into it. Also, since it's a shorter one, uh, if there's anything you want to talk about or there's anything that you found interesting, uh, let me know. We can make extra time in the in the live Q and A. So get that in. All right, let's switch over to the slide deck. So hopefully there's no discontinuity here. We were, we, uh, this chapter is about regression, regression discontinuity. Hopefully it's the one all you folks read. The agenda today really just is uh, a chapter overview. I'm just curious how many of you folks read this chapter? before we get into the chapter overview. Give it the uh, usual 10 second uh, delay. I'm um, because I read three fourths, that counts. Lars read the chapter. Yeah, I mean, if you read the first three fourths, you pretty much got the uh, idea of the chapter. Um, all right, everyone's read this, so we can just dive right on in. Ooh, Julio's got a little bit of foreshadowing here with change point detection, so we'll uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, always try and pull out the three what I think are the three most important concepts in in the chapter, the ones that uh, that stuck out to me. Uh, the first and most obvious one is is look for breaks um, in in time series, not in time series, but along some uh, some running variable. So. We can use those to estimate the causal effects. That's the, the what I thought was also the most important picture in this entire uh, chapter, right in the front actually, so easy to pick out. But um, we, you know, we have some variable of interest or some effect of interest, there's some mediating variable, and then we have a backdoor path into, sorry, not a backdoor path. We have our, uh, the thing that we, the treatment effect or whatever it may be. And there may also be some sort of backdoor paths that we can't exactly observe. Um, but if we then just look at X as a running variable, as uh, Scott calls, you can break that backdoor path here. And then you, even if there's a mediating variable in the middle, you'll still see an effect over here at the end. So makes this a lot simpler to, uh, to work on, right? You don't have to worry about all these different paths and controlling for things like we did in earlier chapters. Um, you just sort of just kind of easily get what, get what you're looking for. Now, that first portion actually was interestingly enough so intuitive that we didn't. it didn't take that much explanation for Scott to explain it, which was quite nice. Um, the Most of the chapter then was about estimating discontinuity, which we'll talk about uh, briefly. So different methods, polynomial fits and kernel, kernel regressions and, uh, and things like that. And then, um, I'm, this is a new thing, not a new thing. This is something outside of the chapter, but uh, Bayesian discontinuity. So it reminds me of a lot of things I've seen in my experience being quite quite Bayesian. Um, and I would want I want to I want to show you folks what those are. So let's talk about regression discontinuity. So Scott used this quote quite a bit. Let me turn my webcam off so you can see it. But if there is a turtle on a fence post, it didn't get there 
by itself. Uh, he brings up that this is part of his uh, when he grew up in Mississippi, I believe that this was a common phrase, and then he sprinkled it in a couple times through the chapter. So, uh, quite a good visual metaphor for for this whole chapter. Um, in this case, if there is a break in the expected earnings uh, or enrollment rate, um, well, this is the enrollment rate graph, but they talk about expected earnings that there's this large break, and if you happen to just be above a threshold, you get in, and if you happen to be below a threshold, you don't. And that was a really good way to estimate future earnings if you get into a top tier, top tier college. So, um, assume making some assumptions. I think this was the this actually this was the, an important point. Making some assumptions that there isn't something else happening at the exact same time as uh, as this SAT cutoff in this case. And if there is a big jump, so in this case it looks like you know visually there's a pretty big jump. Um, we can attribute it to the thing that changed. So in this case, this this jump here is getting into a particular college, and then we can say that college um, helps people earn more money later in life, at least locally. So we'll have a big quote in a second, but at least right around this region, we can say these people would have earned more if they got into college or not. I, a little less explicitly mentioned in the chapter, we can't seem to make the same sort of conclusion about these folks, right? Maybe these folks, regardless if they got into the college or not, depending on who they are, would have made a bunch more money. Uh, but these ones, right over here, right near the boundary. So many mentions in the chapter of how we can uh, go through regression, how we can estimate this regression discontinuity. Um, this was the most important uh, most important paragraph. So a lot of words, a lot of words for a slide. I should again hide my webcam, but I think it lays out everything that needs to be met to satisfy the backdrop criterion. I see Ambika just actually posted a comment on this. So how does treating X as a running variable get rid of the backdoor path? Um, so this is actually where he calls it out. Um, where does he go? He's, I know he says it right in here somewhere. Uh, so, okay, to answer Ambika's question, this one does not satisfy the overlap needed to use matching methods. Therefore, the backdoor criterion cannot be met. So, Ambika, plain and clearly, he states in the book that the backdoor criterion cannot be met using regression discontinuity design. But even if we can't identify, um, even if we can't meet the backdoor criterion, we can identify those causal effects using regression discontinuity. So. Those subjects whose neighborhood, uh, those subjects whose score is in a close neighborhood around the cutoff, specifically we show the average cutoff for the sub subpopulation is identified as X in the limit. So there's a really interesting twist here. Um, we spent three or four chapters talking about backdoor criterion. We now have this new method where we say the backdoor criterion cannot be met, but if we make a couple of assumptions and we use um, the limit, um, then we can make a causal inference right next to the cutoff criterion. So to summarize that, super interesting because, again, we had spent so many chapters building up that you need this backdoor, you need to close these backdoor criterion. You either use um, conditionals like controlling for um, age and um, was it class? It's not class. With like first class, second class, third class on the Titanic example. So if you're in the Titanic, whether you died or not depends on, well, largely depend on your age and then uh, and then which um, sort of seat you had in the Titanic itself. That was all chapter. Then we had another chapter that was about matching and subclassification, as you folks remember. So we have to take two, we'll say people in this case, but it could be anything. Um, and we have to match the person who got the unit, the treatment unit versus the person who didn't get the treatment unit and use those to make estimates, but in this case, we don't have either. We just use the regression and we get a causal inference, which is really cool actually. So, um, also really surprising. We spent so much time building up all that mathematics and that knowledge and and um, turns out in special cases, we might not need it, so. Really great though, actually, because I have to say, uh, for me, this is way more useful for me than in my world than the matching design. So uh, if I quickly talk about um, 
my life at SpaceX. Uh, I can't always do mesh design. You can't always have like one version of a rocket that's one way and one version of a rocket that's another way. There aren't a lot of rockets. Um, but we have a lot of these running time series. I, I should not say time series, right? We have a lot of these running variables and a lot of things. Like let's say heat input into um, into something and then we switch over to new piece of machinery or SpaceX is a company that's constantly changing. So this sort of regression discontinuity is really useful or would have been really useful had I been known about it much more at the time. Uh, a, because it's intuitive, people tend to see it rather than it just being those numbers or those tables that you see. Um, and it sort of just, I don't want to say it comes out of the data, but you, you can collect the data and then look at it later. So this particular uh, example here as well, um, there were a couple paragraphs where Scott talked about, totally outside of statistics, but Scott talked about how um, how you should be really nice to people because when you're really nice to people, they'll believe you and they'll trust you and they'll give you data, which is what happened for this author or for the, the person who published that image, right? That person um, was, I suppose, very friendly with this Texas uh, school who trusted him enough to give him that SAT score and data, which he then could match up to the pay rates of those folks. And then he was able to make a study out of it. So um, let's say, aside from the social ability aside, the, the cool part was the SAT admissions data was not meant for a causal study, right? It was just, um, it was just a college going through its normal operations of deciding how many students to admit and using SAT scores as that particular, in this case, very hard threshold. And just by happening to uh, create this hard threshold for an operational necessity for the college, it turns out later, somebody could then use that to analyze the, um, the efficacy of that college in future, in future pay rates. So you could think about the same thing happening um, in all sorts of companies, right? Maybe, um, I'm not making these examples off the top of my head, but again, when I worked in SpaceX's supply chain, if a certain supplier didn't meet some sort of threshold and we and we treated them differently than another, would that show that we were that there was some uh, some effect on the parts? If I take a more, um, if I take a more, I'm gonna make this example from the top of my head. Let's say you run Twitter and you want to see whether accounts that get um, get engagement, uh, whether that's maybe correlated with the verified mark or not, if there's some sort of threshold of whether somebody gets that verified mark or not, like let's say, well actually here's a really good example given that we're in YouTube. On YouTube you need a thousand subscribers to get a custom URL, so maybe once I hit a thousand subscribers, that being a hard cutoff, and I get some custom YouTube URL, does my engagement increase? I don't know, but that's an example of a discontinuity that's built into YouTube's system, um, and maybe that could be used to analyze causal effects, so. Really, really neat idea. Uh, that is the, uh, let's jump back, back to your virtual window. That is the crux of this chapter. Now, I'm gonna pause here because that's really the largest discussion we're gonna have about the core idea of this chapter. We'd love to hear what you folks have to think. So Ambika says, it feels like the running variable needs to kind of randomly happen, arbitrarily happen, and not be a conscious decision to actually cause something. So I, I think it's the opposite actually, Amika. I think um, that the running variable has to be a hard fixed threshold that doesn't randomly happen, but arbitrarily happen. So not the random part, but the arbitrary ha happen and not be in a conscious decision to actually cause something. So not random from what I understand, definitely it seems like arbitrary. So SAT scores was one, um, drinking age was another one that was brought up. Uh, in America, the drinking age is 20, 21, almost everywhere. Um, and then in other countries, it's 18. So that meets the definition of arbitrary. Um, and the last part you said is not a conscious decision actually causes something. So this was another point. It's not uh, that it's not, I use this word really badly, so I'm probably gonna say it wrong, but not endogenous, right? So there wasn't a person who is sorting each one of these people individually and saying this person goes here and this person goes there. But more so there was a really hard cutoff that if they didn't make it, that they would automatically be rejected. And if they did make it, they might be accepted. So that's the uh, conscious decision, I think, to set an arbitrary threshold, but not a conscious decision to sort 
um, people into one group or another. A good a good counterexample of this is um, in the earlier chapters we had the chemotherapy therapy example about the doctor, and the in that case uh, in that um, which chapter was that? That was the, I'm already forgetting the names of the chapters, but that was the estimating effects chapter, um, where the doctor was consciously moving people into what the doctor thought was the best treatment. So chemotherapy or surgery. And so the sorting was happening on an individual level for each patient based on uh, what that particular doctor thought their best outcome would be. In this case, that's not happening, right? A hard threshold is sorting some people on the left and some people on the right. And a conscious, a conscious decision is not being made for each individual person. Whew. You ask a good question there, Ambika. A lot of a lot of things to unpack, but it really forces us to think through all the pieces of the regression discontinuity design. Um, Chad says you can use the discontinuity to construct a situation for associated causal effects and avoid the backdoor. Yep, Chad summarized that in a much more eloquent way than I just did in that two minute uh, two minute soliloquy. So, Amika, let me know if you feel like your question has been answered between either me or Chad, um, and let's move on. So the establishment of the regression discontinuity, discontinuity design uh, was pretty straightforward. I mean, Scott brought that up right at the beginning. Um, it didn't take a lot of math like earlier chapters to talk through, right? We didn't have to go through all these derivations about randomization inference or, um, or the backdoor paths for instance or the biases on average treatment effect like uh, parallel path bias or the, or the other one. Um, kind of just kind of just pops out at you um so the rest of the chapter most of the chapter then was on estimating uh discontinuity so i'm not going to go into every version of estimating discontinuity because they were just they were listed out in the chapters and i'd say maybe they're more like fundamental math but um there were things like do you use linear regression do you use local um effects regression do you use um you use do you use polynomial regression? Do you use kernel density estimates? So, um, a lot there was a lot of discussion on that. Oops, in the chapter, um, we had a discussion about that in our uh, in our discourse community. So, Neil answered. You know, different functional forms give functional an different answers. So the author needs to take the side in an argument and advance a specific causal theory consistent with the data at hand. Assuming the author is correct, it should replicate. So Neil summarized this for us quite quite well. Um, you got to pick one and you just got to go for it. Um, justify why you did it. And ideally, if it was good, I, if you thought about it well and it was a good justification and it matches up with the underlying, um, not even the underlying model of the world because the models have been constructed by us, but the underlying phenomena of the world, then it would replicate in future studies. Uh, that's what a lot of this chapter was uh, was about. Um, so, doesn't seem like there's a, an agreed upon way that works for everybody. You really just gotta uh, gotta get experience and make a good justification. Uh, for me, which was exciting, there was a reference to Andrew Gelman. So, for those who don't know, Andrew Gelman is. Um, a very prominent Bayesian statistician. He really leads the field um, in many in many ways. So, anytime he writes something, I'm quite interested to see what he has to say. Uh, but he talks about how he has a paper on how higher level polynomials lead to overfitting, and he, Gelman recommends using local linear regression. And then it's kind of funny because in the next sentence, Scott says, "Well, Gelman warns us about higher no higher order polynomials." But I'm going to use one anyway because it's not uncommon. So you could see how even between the experts in these fields and, you know, Gelman, who's a very, very accomplished um, uh, researcher and has, has produced many, he's really, really good statistician. And then you have Scott Cunningham, who also is a really, really good econometrician and, and really great at these uh, um, understanding these methods and explaining them using them. And even they disagree within the span of like, 30 words, like three sentences, and we're like, well, one guy says this, one other guy says that. So, yeah, you just gotta, well, I think you just have to, you know, stick your stake in the ground about what you're gonna do when you're gonna do regression discontinuity design and, um, and 
make a just make a strong claim. Uh, one thing they talked about quite a bit in the chapter, which I was excited about, is this thing called kernels. Um, so this isn't the this isn't a kernel like a Linux kernel or a kernel like a um, linear algebra kernel, but it's something that gets used all over the place and. Shameless plug, it's something that we're talking about a ton in the Gaussian process course that I'm currently building. Um, so I was quite thrilled to see that come up again. This is what a kernel is. I, I don't remember, recall there being the, um, recall there being a strong discussion of it in the book other than it was mentioned as something that could be used. But essentially what you do is you, you can essentially run a regression using this formula here. Ignore the one at the bottom because that's a Gaussian function. But you end up with um, all your data points, your X point of interest uh, and length scale. And when you do that, let's say you want to estimate what the, the point should be here. Um, this being, a, in this case, a continuous function. Uh, you have this blue estimate comes from weight, weighting all these other data points that you've seen. This being the Mauna Loa um, data set from the Keeling curve. And then if you plug this into, if you, if you get the weights, from the previous formula that we see here, and then you sum up the weights, you'll end up with this particular point right here. Um, this blue curve that looks like a Gaussian is not a Gaussian. What it is, is it's the relative weight you apply to each um, adjacent data point. So the points that are very far away get very little weight, so these two get very little weight. The points that are really close get more weight. So this point actually is really close, so it gets the most weight. This point over here is a little bit farther away, so it gets a little bit less weight, but it still gets more than this point over here, which is really far away and gets very little weight. So this is the uh, kernel estimate for a single point. If you if you now take this and you apply it to every point, you end up getting this, uh, this blue line. So we um, don't need to make strong uh, functional form arguments like a linear regression or any, like a straight linear regression or polynomial fit or something like that. Um, but you instead just get in this case, a smooth fit. Now in the regression discontinuity chapter, and I guess I should have posted an example. I will, I will do one, I'll do one after this um, and post it in the discourse. But if there was a strong change, like let's say the CO2 levels just jumped a whole bunch in this case, CO2 parts per million, um, the kernel density estimate would also then jump because it's not stuck to a functional form, but it's using the local data points to weight itself. So just use your imagination here a little bit. Um, but if these points suddenly shifted up, right? If there was some some big event, then we would see a big uh, a big jump, like that. So that's what kernel kernel weighting is. Um, it was a very quick explanation of kernel weighting. Uh, so hopefully that was a little a little that wasn't too much of a jump in terms of, of our of our understanding. So again, any comments about um, estimating regression discontinuity? Uh, you can you, we can talk about um, there was a section there there was the two other sections from the book I didn't cover here because I like sticking to threes is inference which actually we'll talk about a little bit uh, actually a lot of it in this Bayesian discontinuity section so how do you know when a jump is enough of a jump to say it, it was significant or whatever um, whatever framework you're using um, and then there was ones about fuzzy regression discontinuity design and kink regression discontinuity. So fuzzy was you don't have a hard slam, but it like sort of tapers up. And we there was a couple talks about um, methods for working with fuzzy regression discontinuity where it's not a strict jump. And then the other one was kink design where it's not a jump, but like say there's a pattern and then it levels off. But same sort of idea, right? You have something that's like going up, going up, going up, going up. And then there is some running variable, a threshold that's hit, and then it flattens out. So not a discontinuity, but definitely a, uh, a piecewise functional change in the running variable and the response that we are seeing. All right. I feel like oh, that's the wrong window. Um, I feel like we are really just getting into it today. So Bayesian discontinuity. Um, Julio was very, uh, knew, he sort of knew what was going to happen. Maybe he, he snuck a peek at the slide deck when I posted it on the discourse a moments before. This is not in the, in the textbook, but it reminds me a lot about, uh, what we're doing. So 
when um, something that was really interesting to me when I first started in Bayesian statistics, actually the thing that got me interested in Bayesian statistics was this, this sort of thing. What we have here on the right um, is a picture of the number of coal mining accidents that I believe happened in England um, from around like 1840 up until 1890. Well, well, we don't know. So right around here, a piece of legislation was passed. And then we have the number of coal mining disasters that happened after that. So legislation was passed to make coal mines coal mine safer and the question is did it did it help um i again important question right we have a new policy did something end up uh, changing to make well did something end up changing that's really just the question so uh let me i can pull up the notebook and we can just we can briefly go through it and i'll uh the slides are in this course so if you if you want to grab them there let me just uh let me just paste them here. So you can see the slides are right here. You guys can grab them right over there. But um, essentially, this is what's called a switch point analysis. So a, such a similar idea. We have an early rate um, with some prior, uh, late rate with some prior. In this case, the priors happen to be the same. We have a switch point. And then what we want to see is whether the Poisson rate of, um, of disasters uh, is different. So create a PIMC model, uh, do some inference, and then we end up with with this graph, which we also have in the deck. So uh, we have an early rate, which it looks like it was around a mean of three. We have disasters missing, uh, which is the next rate, and these two rates are not the same. Sorry, early rate and late rate, and then we can see these rates look like they're different. This one's at three, this one's at one. Um, a force plot would make this easier to see, but they look different. So maybe we can make the causal claim in this case that because there was this arbitrary event that happened about legislation passing, that whatever policy was enacted for to mitigate coal mining disasters actually actually worked. So this is probably how I would do it with a, with a, an Bayesian myth in a Bayesian way. Um, here is the same switch point graphs. There's a lot going on in these graphs. There's a lot of Bayesian stuff happening in these graphs. So uh, if you have any questions, please do post them. Um, and then also maybe post in discourse and we can chat about it, chat about it there. But an example of a regression discontinuity. And then uh, another way, um, another thing is the causal impact package. So. Um, this is different because it's a time series, but it's essentially, and it, uh, the functionality is a little bit different than regression discontinuity and the way we make inference there. But this causal impacts package was written uh, in R. There's a version in Python now as well. But it's if a certain event happened and we see a discontinuity in our time series, um, can we make the effect? Can we make the, the claim that, um, that there was a, like the name says, a causal, causal impact? So two things um, outside of the chapter to, to check into and see if they're there. Um, see if, uh, what you would call it? I don't know if they help in any way or add more for you in, the, in, the, in building out your knowledge of regression discontinuity. Amika says, the legislation is not arbitrary because it was passed specifically to decrease the coal mining disaster. So Amika, Amika you're right. There, the legislation was not arbitrary in the sense that it was passed to reduce the the uh, decrease the amount of coal mining disasters, but what we're trying to estimate here is the causal effect of whether the legis whatever was in the legis legislation helped or not, right? So it's not so much about the legislation itself being um, arbitrary in the sense that it was meant to have a causal effect, but it was arbitrary in the sense that it happened at a just random point in time, right? There's nothing there's nothing in the world that changed in 1890 that we know of that would prevent coal mining disasters other than this legislation passing, right? And because nothing other than this legislation passed, we can attribute the decrease in coal mining disasters to, to the policies that were in that legislation. So um, you, there was an earlier example brought up um, in, in the book about whether um, social aid helps people get out of poverty or not, right? And there, there was a big discussion on that in the matching and subclassification chapter. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, it was another example from like the very early 1800s. And the point there was like, maybe, you know, government passes these social policies and they don't help people. Um, we should find out. 
And so in that case, Scott was arguing, I believe he was using a regression matching design to, to prove or disprove that causal claim. In this case, we can use regression discontinuity design to um, make a strong claim about the effects of this piece of legislation. So the highlight here is that now we know multiple tools for causal inference. We know matching and subclassification and, and all that. Um, but we also know about regression discontinuity design. And what we can do is we can avoid all of the stuff we had to do in the past about matching and subclassification um, by instead saying if something happens at a particular point in a running variable, in this case it happens to be time, um, did that thing actually have an effect on what we care about? And in this case, it looks like it looks like it it did. The policies that were enacted to prevent coal mining disasters actually had an effect on coal mining disasters. So to close out regression discontinuity design, uh, this is this to me again was the most important most important quote. It's a little wordy, but I'll read through it. Regression discontinuity design is often considered a winning design because of its upside in credibly identifying causal effects. As with all designs, its credibility only comes from deep institutional knowledge, particularly surrounding the relationship between the running variable, cutoff, treatment assignment, and the outcomes themselves. Insofar as one can easily find a situation in which a running variable passing some threshold leads to units being siphoned off into some treatment, then continuity is believable. Um, you're probably sitting on a great opportunity, assuming you can use it to do something theoretically interesting and policy relevant to others. So to bring it back to your question, Ambika, in this case, we had a running variable for the coal mining disasters, which was time in this case. The cutoff was the legislation that uh, mining operators had to do something different. And in this case, uh, we saw a big change in the outcome. Now the continuity here is pretty believable. It, everything I know about the industry is that they don't change things sometimes unless they're forced to. And it looked like with the coal mining disasters, they were forced to make a change based on legislation across all, all the companies that were, um, that were being collected as part of those disasters. Um, and in, in this case, it happened to both be theoretical, theoretically interesting for us sitting here in 2020, um, and certainly was a policy relevant to all the people that were, mining, that were mining coal over 130 years ago, right? Like if I was working in a coal mine, uh, I also wouldn't want disasters to happen. So I just thought the coal mining disaster was a particularly cool um, example from both a different, um, well, not in the book. So in, in my PyMC, uh, PyMC world, um, but also interesting for my work in uh, industry. Uh, we always in industry, whether when I was working at the oil tools company or SpaceX or even Sweetgreen or these these organizations, we want people to to be safe and not get hurt. And an analysis like this is is a really interesting way to say if we enact a new policy within the organization, like let's we enact a new food safety standard or we enact a new um, what's called PPE, personal protective equipment, like like uh, glasses or uh, face shields or gloves. And, and if we see less accidents, did did the investment we made in that PPE lead to um, lead to better outcomes? No. Um, so let's talk about what's next. In this case, oh, sorry, not not regression discontinuity, but in this case, instrumental variables. So uh, we'll just keep this train rolling. Uh, we'll go on instrumental variables. We'll give it another two weeks this time. So September 10th, I think will be a good date. Um, that's a normal thing. The second question I have though, is do you guys want more causal casual chats or casual causal chats? So last week uh, we did um, we did something new. I had Dimitri on as a guest. And so if you folks like that, if that was an interesting part of this book club, let me know, I'll get more guests on. Definitely we'll get Scott Cunningham on. I um, feel like we have to because he's the author of this book. And so I will schedule a time with him maybe closer towards the end of our book club. So we have more of the book under our belt. But if you want others, do let me know. Um, other than that, we will jump to our, our Q&A.
So I see a couple things coming in. Let me uh, let me read through them. Amika says, so in practice we could use RDD when new features are released because we're trying to make a change and we're not changing anything else. So the, then that feature then that feature chain change assuming nothing else changes with time being the running variable. Um, so okay, I, in this case, I believe you mean like a web context. So if I'm a if I'm a uh, if I run a website and we release a new feature or software, we can assume that change maybe let's say in conversion rate or time on website or click through rate, whatever metric we're doing, is associated with just the change that we made, uh, assuming nothing else changes. Yes, that seems to be the um, that seems to be the claim about about regression discontinuity design. And it looks like in this case, um, the regression discontinuity is um, with time, yes. So it's feature release specifically. That's what I understand regression discontinuity to believe. Very intuitive understanding of what's going on. And I think that's actually one reason I think regression discontinuity is really interesting is that uh, it doesn't impede with um, with uh, like a normal business operation. We just release the feature um, as is. And then if we see a change, we can attribute it just to, um, just to the feature that we released. Now, I think the problem with websites in particular is there is a lot of things changing at the same time, right? There's a lot of features being released at the same time. Um, consumer behavior changes. But I think another, like a good example of regression discontinuity design probably was the pandemic, to be quite honest. Uh, that was clearly a big, really big discon discontinuous event for society all at once. Um, so I'm pretty sure we can say a big pandemic causes a lot of changes in the economy, for instance, right? That's like a really prime example that's, that's uh, recently, recently relevant. Chad says, I like the example of the jump in driving fatalities in, at 21 and looking for other causes um, by looking at several possible factors. So yes, and I thought, and it was interesting there because in that case, you have discontinuities at different ages and different countries. So he brought up that Uruguay or another country has allows people to drink at 18. So uh, in this case, we could be sure that age wasn't a factor because, well, we can safely make the assumptions that humans grow and progress at the same rate whether they're standing in America or they're st in the United States or whether they're standing in Brazil or some other country. Um, and in that case, we sort of get both a regression discontinuity design and a matching design um, because we can see if the drunk driving or accident rate, I believe, changed um, in different countries at that discontinuous point of when people were allowed to legally purchase alcohol. Um, Julio says the 10th is a Saturday. Uh, whoops, that is definitely a mistake. Um, let me see. Let me flip a calendar here. Uh, if the 10th is a Saturday, we don't want to do it on that date. We do want to do it on, it's really hard to find a calendar. Um, all right. I will post in the discourse, um, but, um, we want it to be the next, we want it to be that that's the Sunday. Um, so I will change that to the 11th, the book club, next book club will be on the 11th. Sorry for messing up that date. Uh, there may also be a lag for some changes. So I, I would agree I th that some changes for time-based changes. I bet there would be a lag. Um, I think that's probably why in the book, he didn't use a lot of time-based changes. I think in that case, he used a lot of um, a lot of changes that were time independent, which I th which was quite smart. Um, I'm now extrapolating out of my knowledge from the book, but I assume if time lagged, that you would have what's the fuzzy regression design, the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So if something didn't switch over immediately and there was a lag, you would see that happen, uh, and we would want to use the methods that he brought up brought up there. So. Uh, let me pull up my screen again real quick. Um, causal inference mixtape. So that would be 
Um, um, where was it? All right, fuzzy RDD design. So Julio, here's here's what I um, what I would assume what we would do, right? If if something was leading up, if something was gonna like, going to come into place, and then it took a lag, we would have that sort of design. So he talks about Medicare enrollment. That's actually a good example um, because I know you can enroll in Medicare a little bit earlier, later than 65. Lars says, interesting, Chad, in Germany would be difficult because you can pretty much drink before you are allowed to drive. Yeah, so Lars, maybe to Scott's point um, about the drinking example, which we can actually just bring up, um, which countries, it's really hard to read. Um, all right, I'm going to stop trying to zoom in. But I think this is the this is sort of the point Scott is is making. It seems like we can we can sort of he doesn't explicitly say it if I remember correctly. I'm stretching my memory here a little bit. Uh, but he he essentially seems to be saying that you can use uh, the age as a running variable, and then you can use another country as a control. In this case, he used he used Uruguay. So maybe Germany would be a poor control, like you said, because you can drink you can drink wherever so there wouldn't be a um a discontinuity like we have in the united states but in this case he decides to use uruguay because they do have a discontinuity at 18 and so if you see the same effect happen at the same time then maybe we can assume the uh the two are um that the legal drinking age has a causal effect on the number of and fatalities. Now, the the counter argument I make to that is I wonder if the drinking culture and the driving culture is different between the two countries, right? So maybe in Uruguay, kids can't afford cars, so they just don't have cars. So you don't see that effect because they're not getting into drunk driving accidents. Um, or maybe, or maybe the only United States we have kids that just get turned twenty one and just get blind drunk and then and then start driving. Those are the parts that I th he, um, to Umbika's point earlier, um, there may be other backdoor paths that we didn't necessarily close. We don't have the world where you have someone who's, uh, who's 18. <laughs> well, we don't have the thing in America where half the kids who turn 18 can dr drink and half the kids who turn 21 can drink. So then you have this perfectly matched design. But, um, but it seems like we can plausibly get our way around it using regression discontinuity design in different different countries. Chad also says a lot of people graduate from college around the age of 21 in the United States. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, I'm not saying this because I'm particularly proud or any way of saying this, but I just want to point out that you, Chad Chad brings that as an alternate possible cause. Yeah, that I could have, I was able to buy one of my first cars once I graduated and had a job. And I also then uh, could afford alcohol and to go to bars because I also had a job. So uh, a good way, Chad, of, of, you know, pointing out two backdoors, at least in my personal life, that like I turned 21 and I happened to also then get money and a job. So those could be different factors in that I was driving more. I was driving much, much more because, um, because I had a car and I needed to drive to a job. So maybe I got in, I could get in and actually I got into more accidents after I graduated college because I was driving every day to work rather than just walking to college um, than, uh, than, than I did when I was in college. So yeah, it's, uh, it seems like these methods, this method in particular requires you to do a lot of explaining of why like the quote unquote turtle got under the fence post more than previous, des previous designs. And he says about the time lag before you see an effect, how would we design an RDD for student loan forgiveness that was passed as new legislation in the US just passed this week? Any, I have no idea. I maybe, um, I would say post in the discourse. Uh, that's actually a great post for the discourse, especially since this chapter didn't have a lot of, a lot of topics. Post that in the discourse and let's see what other folks have to think about that. You know, I do wonder if it's, um, I wonder what econometrician is going to, to study that particular thing. Um, and the, for the, for those who are in different countries, um, I don't know who is, but the United States just, uh, forgave 
either ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars worth of loans for for certain people, um, a large swaths of people, and there's a lot of debate going on this week about whether that's good for the country or bad for the country, whether that helps people or that's going to hurt our economy. Wildly on both sides, speculative now for sure, but I wonder as um, as time goes on and this becomes more widely studied, uh, whether this also will turn into some sort of regression discontinuity design study, right? Like if once this was passed, did people's spending habits change? I, I did um, people were people able to pay off loans? I have no idea, but I'm quite fascinated to to find out. So with that, I have nothing else on this particular chapter. I will give it the requisite 10 seconds to see if anyone else has anything to say. Amika says, I imagine isolate the legislation by investigating possible effects and cutting them out. I imagine that's also what would happen. I don't, I suppose there'd maybe See what I, what was not discussed much in this chapter, and maybe it'll be discussed in the next chapter. Is is um, how much like sub classification do you need to do, or how much do you need to like cut down to let's say a particular group, like New Yorkers, people that live in the state of New York that graduated in the last five years, and to see whether it had an effect on them. Like I wonder um, if you have to like subset the population into subpopulations, and then and then figure out whether there was a um, an effect or not but maybe Scott was keeping it simple in this particular chapter by using things that you just use the total population like population of US and Uruguay drivers and um, also uh, people that made it into a particular college or not but as we go on to the next chapters I wonder how this would would uh, will come up again the neatest thing though which I find is now we're ending up with a lot of causal inference um, both fundamentals like back, backdoor criteria and things like that, and also tools like matching and subclassification, propensity scores for matching and subclassifications, randomization inference, and now regression discontinuity. Um, and they seem to be um, coming together, right? Like we seem to be using multiple things at the same time or seemingly like we have the ability to use multiple things at the same time. So really building out a causal inference tool belt here. And he says, for the drinking age question, would studying Canadian drinking age help? I know in Alberta it went from 18 to 19 years old. My hot take on this seems like Scott's making that argument um, quite plausibly in the in the book. Um, but it also goes a little bit back to Julio's argument that maybe there's a fuzziness there because um, there were some 18-year-olds who already were drinking and now that they're not drinking. So is it going to like flip over? I'm not quite sure. Different provinces have different drinking ages. So, potentially in Canada, they can compare them one, one next to the other. A lot of questions this week about when regression discontinuity works and when it doesn't. Um, and I do want to point out again, they don't, it's not, it's not as cut and dry as the previous ones, like matching and subclassification and, uh, and um, yeah, matching and subclassification and just particularly matching. I, Neil, again, I think answers it really well here that you just have to take a side in the argument and advance a specific specific causal theory. Oh, and I don't have my screen up. Uh, right here. So I think that pretty much summarizes the chapter. Um, regression discontinuity is pretty cool because you don't really have to do a lot of experimental design. You just find a running variable that has a hard, semi-hard threshold and then see if there's a jump. And then you pick the model that you want to use to estimate that jump. And then you just really stand your ground and be like, this is the this is the causal theory. This is the model that I'm gonna use, whether it's polynomial or kernel density estimate or straight linear, um, single order linear regression. And then you just state your claim. <laughs> and then and then that's, that's what it is. So um, fascinating to see that this is something that's becoming as, uh, not necessarily discontinuous, but something that uh, Scott points out in the first picture of this book, like was uh, was determined in 1950 or 1960 by a particular author, and nobody really cared about it for 40 years, and all of a sudden, a lot of people really care about it. So, uh, I sort of a meta example of regression discontinuity in that, and that it was here, 
not really all that popular. And then all of a sudden, one one group of folks or two folks, Angus and Levy, pu- publish a paper, and suddenly, like, it's the new hot topic, topic of the week. So, well, of the, definitely of this millennium, right, right, right around the year two thousand. So, uh, I don't know. I don't have anything more insightful to say. All right, giving it the last final 10 seconds to see if anybody has any questions and wants to throw anything else out there. Otherwise, I will consider this to be another successful week. I'll point out nobody had any, any, um, uh, any thoughts about the casual causal chats. So post in the discourse if you have anybody that you would like to see either see or whether you just like another one of those sessions. But, uh, with that, and this was quite another successful week. Um, the next one will be on the 11th, and I will see you then. Enjoy your Sundays, everybody.